last time we, we spoke about finite sets, the cardinality of a finite set, and the idea of a map uh, between sets. Now, uh, recall that, the, that, that when you have a map, right, it has a very specific direction and it goes from a, codomain, uh, from a domain set to a codomain set. So when you are giving a map, when you're defining a map, when you're trying to explain to someone what a map is, uh, it is important to include, it's part of the definition of a map that you need to say what the domain set is and what the codomain set is. So uh, the, the, the idea of a map, and this goes for all the rest of mathematics from now forward, okay, the whole idea of a map does include within itself what the domain and what the codomain is. Okay, and then this, there was a little bit of notation that I introduced, I gave some examples. And, uh, and I kind of explained that, and, and we're going to see more of this today, that, uh, that there's a certain kind of map that you are very familiar with, namely maps from R to R. And uh, you're also familiar with the idea of drawing the graph of a map. And, and there, when you draw that graph, you can see what I'm talking about, because you can see that the first thing you draw is the domain and the codomain. And then you draw the graph of the map. So it, 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 even, from, even from what you know in the past, the, 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 prime, the primary importance of the domain and codomain uh, you know, are clear. Okay, so let's, let's move on. So uh, we need to talk a little bit about uh, these maps. Um, okay, and the most important thing about these maps so maps maps of sets they are uh they are endowed with a certain special operation. They have an extremely important operation. Um, and that operation is called composition. Okay, so the, the definition is as follows. So the composition of a map, I'll call the first map F, and it will go from the domain X to the codomain Y. Okay, and then the second map is going to go from Y to a third set Z. So notice that uh, the composition can only be defined when the codomain of the first map is the same set. as the uh, domain of the second map, okay? So I'm sure that this is not too surprising to you, but if F goes from X to Y, and if G goes from Y to Z, then these are what are called composable maps. So this condition, This condition is the same thing as saying that F and G are composable. Okay, and um, <clears throat> and this composition is a map, and the map. Um, is 
denoted by G circle F. Okay. which is a map from, no surprise here, from X all the way to Z. And this map is defined to take an element X, oops, it takes an element X in X and maps it to an element in Z, which is kind of obvious what it is, but it's, you apply F to X, that will produce, so X, little X is in here, F of X is in Y. So this element, this is an element of Y. And then if I apply G to that, then I will indeed get something which is in Z. So this is the definition of the composition of two maps. The composition is only defined when the maps are composable. And when, it, when, it, when the maps are composable, we are able to combine the two maps to give one map. And in so doing, right, it, it allows you to avoid or it allows you to forget about an important piece of information, which is what was the uh, codomain of the first map and what was the domain of the second map. Okay, so once you have taken F, remember that F contains as part of its defining information, the domain and the codomain and the same goes for G. But when we compose them and when we produce this map, then this map no longer has that extra information of Y. It only knows X, Z and the map from X to Z. Okay, so you can kind of see that um, in a way when you compose two maps, it's like a more efficient way of describing the, um, the, the consecutive behavior of F and G. You don't have to first do F and then G. It's, it's a kind of, in a way, simplification, just like uh, you might have, uh, you know, taken expressions for polynomials and multiplied them together and then simplified the result, right? Once you simplify the result in a way, let's say if you take the product of two polynomials and then you simplify it, right? Once you've simplified it, you no longer know what the pair of original polynomials was. So you're throwing away some information, right, in the process. So anyway, that's what it is. So, um, so that's the definition. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, let me just draw a picture. So we, we have x, y, and z. We have the map f going from x to y. We have the map g going from x to z. And then we have the composition f circle g going from x to z. Okay, and uh, just um, it's not difficult to remember why the order is this way. It's, it's just because of the way that you apply them, right? F is applied first. So that's why we put the F on the right, okay? It is a little bit confusing that, you know, if F is first and then G is second, why wouldn't we put F first and G second? Well, okay, that, that is what I'm trying to explain is that it's just a silly notational convenience that we put them in this order so that it's obvious that when you apply it to an element, you first apply F and then you apply G. And so F is on the right-hand side of G. Okay. And um, the, uh, the really important thing about this important operation, so this, so this is the second statement. I just want to make two important statements about maps, and then we can uh, summarize everything that we've done so far. So this um, operation satisfies an important condition, which is called associativity.
Um, and uh, okay, so what does that mean? So this just means that, so let me put it as a proposition here. And this is part of the homework. So uh, it's, it's very easy, but, but just it's worth working through it very carefully in your mind. So the, the proposition is that um, given any maps f going from x to y, g going from y to z, and h going from z to w, f, g, and h, such that f, g, and g, h are composable. Okay, so I'm just writing here what I drew in the picture. You can see from the picture that f goes from x to y and g goes from y to z, and because of the coincidence of the codomain of f and the domain of g, they are composable. Okay, similarly, G and H are composable. So given, G, given FGH such that they're pairwise composable, FG and GH, okay, um, there's two different ways of composing th these three maps. One way is to um, compose F with G. So this would be a map from x to z. And then we can compose the result with h. Okay. The other possibility is that you could compose g and h, because of course they are composable. So g and h can be composed. And then we can pre-compose it with f. I just say pre-compose because I'm saying that f goes on the right-hand side is applied first. Okay, and so the uh, the condition of associativity is that these two maps are equal. This is an equality of maps. Okay, so just just to be uh, so that's the statement of associativity. The the statement of associativity is that as long as you have F G and H in a row like that. You could compose G and H and then F, or you could compose F and G and then H. And the resulting maps are the same, they're equal. Okay, so what does equality, just, um, just as, as an aside, what does equality of maps mean? So if, if, if we have two maps from X to W, let me call them uh, I and J, we say that I is equal to J, when they determine the same map. They do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to write this formally in the following way. So when are two maps equal, what does it mean? It means that for all elements in X, they have the same value. For all x and x, i of x is equal to j of x in w. In other words, i of x and j of x must be the same element of the set w. Oops. All right. Um, Right. So this is the most important thing about maps. This is why people love maps so much. It's because they they kind of uh, they they uh, they're kind of specifically designed to model these kind of composable processes where you where you undergo a certain change and you get a result. And that result is like the input to a second change and a third change and so on, right? So it's, it's like, um, it, it has a, 
uh, it has a kind of similarity to time or travel or manufacturing or um, linking to, you know, from one web page to another, or all of these things which involve a starting and an ending point, an arrow that has a tail and a tip, right? Um, these are modeled by maps. They have a direction, uh, or if you wish, they have an initial and final state, a domain and a codomain, okay? Um, and, and you, you know, they, they, they have this, um, and maybe, maybe the best uh, analogy for the modern age is, is a kind of computation where you, you begin with initial data and you undergo certain sequences of changes, right, that you call computation, and then you end up with something. And then you might stop, but maybe someone else might take that data and it, they might operate on the data and produce some new data and so on and so on. Okay, so th this directional description of change or modification is um, somehow fundamental, not just for sets, but for every mathematical object. Uh, uh, al almost all ob objects, um, almost all parts of mathematics are, are completely kind of swimming in these in these maps or morphisms as they're sometimes called okay and uh there, there's one little thing i just want to mention um, before the the main summary which is that um there's also a special besides the fact that maps have composition in addition to the composition operation. Um, every set, there, there's a special, there's a special type of map. And in mathematics, when we, when we notice something special, we like to call it distinguished, almost like it's a distinguished gentleman or something. It's a distinguished or a distinguished gentle lady or a distinguished gentle person. There is a special or distinguished map associated to any set and it's called um, the identity map. So the identity map is a map from X to X and it takes every element. This is one of those silly, th these are these things in mathematics that seem at first glance to be very silly but and end up being kind of important. That you take every element in the set and you just send it to itself. You do nothing. And so th this is a special map associated to every set. This is the identity map on the set X. I just wanna make sure that there is no confusion about this. Okay, and um, and uh, an obvious uh, fact, uh, which you could prove if you wanted to, but it would be kind of a single line or maybe not even, is that uh, this um, identity maps,
do not affect um, other maps when uh, composed. So what do I mean by that? I just mean that if you have a map, a general map from X to Y, right? Then we need to remember whenever we see a set, there's always a distinguished map from that set to itself, the identity map. And, and that's for the codomain. The domain also is a set, and so it has an identity map. And of course, uh, it's true, it's a, it's a kind of um, uh, proposition or uh, kind of obvious proposition that, that we could take the map F and we could pre-compose it with the identity map on X. And the point is that this is just going to reproduce F itself. And I could also post-compose F by the identity on Y. So that is, we have this This uh, is a is a is a property of the distinguished maps. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to say about maps and sets. Well, I mean, just their definition. We're going to say a lot more about about them in, in a moment. Okay, but but right now, okay, what have we what have we done? So we have defined, right, sets, which are you should think of them as objects, or you could even think of them as data, or something that is. Um, it's almost like you could think of it as that, that it has a static existence. It's just fixed. You have a set, okay? And then between two sets, you have the notion of a map. A map is, you could think of it as a process or a, a step in a computation or something like that. We saw that it could be a color, et cetera. Okay, and these maps can be composed. And the important thing about the composition is that it does not depend on the order in which you compose the maps, right? That's what associativity is all about. Associativity is a simplifying assumption or a, a simplifying property. It says that, you know, as soon as you introduce these maps, you start to, they start to proliferate because you can compose them, right? So you could have, you see, like, I just started with, two, with three maps, F, G, and H. And then from these three, I produced a whole bunch of other maps. Like I produced G compose F, H compose G, and then the composition of this with H and, and this with F. So from three maps, I produced you know, this other one, this other one, this other one, and this other one. So there were four additional maps that I got out of the original three. Okay, And you could imagine that in some world, maybe they're all different. But uh, in the real world, in, in set theory, um, or, and, and in most, most parts of mathematics, the uh, composition is associative, which simplifies our life a lot. Because it means that we don't actually need these brackets. We don't actually need to write the brackets. We can just write. So once you know this fact, once you know that, that there's an equality of the different compositions, you could then use the notation, this justifies the use of the notation H, G, F without brackets, okay? Without the associativity condition, this wouldn't have a meaning, okay? Uh, th this would be undefined because the composition is only defined for two maps with one output map, two input maps, you compose them if they're composable, and then you have one output. 
Okay, so this would have no meaning at all according to the way that composition was defined. But because of associativity, you can define this exactly by this formula or by this formula, and it does not matter which one you use. Okay, so associativity is just a simplifying uh, a property, which actually is true in, in, uh, in most, the vast majority of mathematical contexts. Where uh, where you have maps, okay, okay. So we, we have associativity of the maps, and we have identity maps for each object. So everything that I just said, okay, this structure is incredibly important in mathematics, and it's called a categorical structure. It's called a category. Okay, so what we have just described, so all of this. Um, is um, is what uh, all of this defines uh, the category of uh, of sets or even of finite sets. I'm focusing on finite sets. So a category it has a, a category. I can define it, it's quite simple. A category is anything that has, that behaves like this. That's what a category is. So a category, a category is consisting of two types of things, is, is made of, consists of, two things. The first thing is objects, in this case, sets. And morphisms. And sometimes these are called arrows, e.g. maps of sets. OK. That's the, the category has these two constituents. OK, it has to have objects and it has to have morphisms. And um, and uh, and the morphisms must satisfy associativity. So there's a such that morphisms can be composed such that um, Any morphism has a domain and codomain, and um, there is a composition. There's an associative composition. By the way, the, the domain and codomain are objects. There's an associative composition of morphisms. And there are identity morphisms for each object. Satisfying the the, the obvious uh, rule, which which we just wrote above. Okay, so any time that you have, you know, a certain type of object, and and uh, and then morphisms from one object to another, so it's a directed relationship from one object to another such that those can be composed in an associative way and with identity maps, we have a category. And the simplest category is the category of finite sets. And we're going to um, study a few different categories in this course, okay? Uh, the, the, um, 
I don't want to make a huge deal about category theory. This is not a class on category theory. You can wait until you're in graduate school for that. But the basic idea of a category is really simple. It's really simple. It's something that everyone can understand. Um, and and we always we, and we can always draw, we can always draw like graphically. Okay, we can represent objects as points and we can describe morphisms as arrows, right? And so we can always, um, for example, uh, we can draw a simple category like this, where you have three objects, let's say X, Y, and Z. Okay, and you could imagine that there, in this category, there is a morphism f from x to y and maybe there's a morphism from y to z and um you know if there's a morphism from x to y and from y to z then certainly we could compose them and we could draw an arrow like that okay and so in this picture for example you should think that x this point is a set it could be the set for example the set of all children and this could be the set of all schools and every child every child in the set of all children you know just just for fun let, let me let me put it like this so this is like children and this is like elementary schools right so every every child or i mean it's supposed to be like according to the law every child every member Every object, sorry, every element of the set of children, right, is supposed to go to a specific elementary school. And so there would be a map from the set of children to the set of elementary schools, right? There's not a map the other way. There's, the direction doesn't go that way. If you, if, you, uh, if you took an elementary school and you tried to map it to a child, it doesn't make any sense. Wh which child are you going to pick, right? So you're not going to get an element in the set of children from a school, right? So there's a, there's a directional, right? And then, um, right. And, and, so, uh, and so then you could imagine, you know, uh, every, um, every elementary school is going, to re is going to receive a ranking, let's say. Maybe the ranking... Maybe the ranking is a is is a you know is is like a movie or something where you have uh, you know three stars so one two three right so the the rate the ranking or the rating right so every elementary school is assigned some rating one to three by the state let's say so we have a set of children being mapped to a set of elementary schools we have a set of elementary schools being set being mapped to the set one, two, three, right? And then we could compose and we could assign a rating to every child. Amazing. This is like, a, this is a very simple idea, but um, you get the point. So this is, uh, this whole diagram is happening in the category of sets, let's say. Okay. Um, so that's that's the that's the end of part one. This is the category of finite sets. Any questions now? Any questions about the category of finite sets? Yes. Hi. Please go ahead. Hi. Well, I want to ask a question. Uh, when we say that two objects are compo composable, should we just mention the order or there's random? Please. Okay, so the question is, if you want to say, you, uh, I just want to correct something you said. You said the two objects are composable. No, it's two maps. Two maps can be composable. Okay, and uh, you, uh, if you wanted to be very precise, you could say you could say that codomain of F is equal to domain G. You could just write that as F G being composable. So if you wrote codomain F equals domain G, 
that would be the absolutely precise way of saying that they are composable. Okay. Uh, and I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, when we are mentioning maps, should we yes. just specify um, the codomain and the domain? Yeah, normally, normally, unless it is obvious, most of the time it's obvious what the domain and codomain is because you're in a certain context uh, and you don't usually need to say it. But uh, but if there is any kind of confusion whatsoever, you need to specify the domain and the codomain. Yeah. And it's always good to think about what the domain and codomain of a map are. Okay, thanks. Nava, please go ahead. Just uh, ask the question directly. Yeah, so for me, I just was looking at the assignment one, and it says due Monday, September 21st, but the Monday is the 19th, and the 21st, I think, is a Wednesday. So I just wanted to clarify that due date. Oh, um, so usually I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to. Uh, 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 um, I don't want to make you feel bad for asking a question. But uh, for that kind of question, we, we should leave it for uh, after the class. Uh, during the class, we it's better to keep, stay in the material because otherwise it just throws people out of out of the the idea of what's happening. But let me just answer that question. So uh, the the due date on the syllabus was the 18th. And the due date on Crowdmark is the 19th. I gave you an extra day for the first assignment. I don't know where you got the 21st. Uh, there must be a mistake somewhere. But hopefully the Crowdmark is correct. Is the Crowdmark correct, everyone? It's due on the 19th, correct? OK, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Iker? If I make, uh, if I butcher your name, just say your name when you ask the question. Iker, go ahead. Yes, um, I had a question about identity maps. Yeah. Uh, so if you have the identity map of a set X, yes. does that map have the same cardinality as said set? You're asking about the cardinality of which set? Which set are you asking about the cardinality of? Uh, if we have a set a set X, is the cardinality of the set X and the cardinality of the identity map of that set the same? So are they you said you, you asked about what the cardinality of the set X is? Yes. Okay. And you were comparing it with the cardinality of another set, but I don't know what that other set is. What is the other set that you're talking about? Uh, uh, the um, the cardinality of the map of the identity map, right? Well, you have to be careful. Like I'm, I'm trying to get you uh, into trouble, right? So, the cardinality is something that you know when you say cardinality of something, that something has to have to be a set. So, what set oh. are you talking about? <laughs> The map is not a set, it's a, it's a map. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could, for example, form a set out of the map by just taking a set containing one element, the map IX, but then that cardinality would just be one. Okay, okay. I, just think about your question. You, you can probably figure out a way to make the question make sense, but I'm just trying to get you used to the, the language. Nora, please go ahead. Sorry, I still confused about this identity maps do not affect other maps when it comes up. Can you just make an example? I, I just wrote what that means right below. So, so here, what it means is that, so, okay, let's say that I, okay, so let me give an example. Suppose that we look at the set one, two, three, and the set one, two, three, four. Okay, so we have two, let's say this is X and this is Y. So I'll draw a picture of X like this, and I'll draw a picture of Y like this. Is that okay? You understand what X and Y are? Yes. Okay, now an example of a map, okay. A map, what, is, what does it need to do? So let me just draw, uh, 
I'm just going to draw, I'm going to make the picture a little bit more kind of um, a little bit more like a cartoon. So we have two sets, X and Y. Okay. And X contains the elements one, two, three, Y, one, two, three, four. Now a map. A map is supposed to send every object, every element of the domain. This is the domain of the map. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna try to define a map from X to Y. This will be the domain and this will be the codomain of F. Okay, so what does F have to do? It has to take an element of the domain and map it to an element of the codomain. And it must do that for every element of the domain. So for example, I need to decide where is one sent? Well, I could decide when I'm defining my map. So I'll send it to, let's say two. One is sent to two. Okay, now, okay, so I did that. I, I explained where one is sent. Now, where will two be sent? I can choose to define it in, in a different way. There's many different maps from X to Y, many, many different maps. One of the possible maps will send one to two and two to four. And let's say that three, then we could, just, we could ask for it to be sent to two as well. So this is a map. Everything in the domain is now sent. So this is a map, okay? It doesn't matter if there are points in the codomain which are not achieved, and it does not matter if two points in the domain happen to be sent to the same point, as long as you're going from one side to the other, and as long as you map everything on that side to something on the other side, you're okay. Okay, so this is an example of a map. Okay, so you could, you could have defined it in a different way. You could have said F goes from X to Y, such that F of one is two, and F of three is also two, and F of two is four. This is another way of defining the map if you don't like cartoons. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can, thank you. Now the, now the identity map. So in order to see an identity map, let's uh, talk about the two identity maps. So let's say that you have one, two, three. So here's X again. And let me make a copy of X. Okay, so here's X and then X again. And I want to show you the distinguished map from X to X. That distinguished map is called I sub X and it goes from X to X. I shouldn't use uh, this cartoon notation. I'll just use the proper notation, I sub X. And what does it do? It takes one to one, it takes two to two, and it takes three to three. That's an identity map. They all look like this. Similarly, okay, if I take one, two, three, four, here's Y. I can make a copy of Y and I can define the identity map on Y, which takes one to one, two to two, three to three, and four to four. Very simple. Identity maps are always doing nothing. They send everything to itself, okay? Now, uh, let's say that we, um, uh, yeah, so now let's look at composition. Okay, so right. So, for example, if I wanted to compose F, oops, sorry, if I wanted to compose F with I sub X, what does that mean? Oops. Uh, 
Okay, so if I wanted to uh, look at this composition, what was F again? F took one and three to two, and it took two to four. Sometimes I, I'll forget to put the arrowheads, but we're going from left to right anyway. And then the identity map goes from one to one, two to two, and three to three. So this component is the identity map on X. Okay, this set here is X. This set here is a copy of X. And this set here is Y. Okay. So, and this part here is F. And to compose is literally to um, stick these two things together like layers. Okay. So, Ix goes first, it takes one to one, and then it maps that, and then f maps that, the result, to two. And then two is sent to two is sent to four, and three is sent to three is sent to two. So in total, this would be equal to, right, if I, if I just simplify everything, by just computing, right? So you say, where does one get sent? Well, one gets sent to one gets sent to two. So it goes, sent, it goes to two then. Two gets sent to four and three gets sent to two. So you see that this is just F. Composing a map with an identity map does not affect the map that you started with, F. Okay, and the same thing is true if you do it in the other order. So if you do F first, so similarly, F composed, post composed with I sub Y is also F, okay? Um, does that help your understanding? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll do another question, um, Wang Kong. Uh, hi, Professor. Hi, right, go ahead. Uh, 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 completion, what's the different uh, category with uh, completion? Uh, it has nothing to do with completion. Um, category, because uh, you also define... Sorry, what's your, what's your question? My question is, I'm confusing category the definition with the composition. Uh, how to distinguish... Sorry, what are the two things? I'm just trying to get definition. you to clarify. Sorry, try to simplify your question. Okay. Okay, you'll find about, about category. category. Yes, and the category that uh, looks similar as a composition. A composition is one of the features of a category. Composition is an operation on maps, right? So the, what is a category? A category has to have objects, for example, sets, and it has to have morphisms. For example, maps, okay? And these maps has to have domain and codomain objects. So they have these maps have to have codomain and domain sets. And there must be an associative composition on these maps. So finite sets together with maps, together with composition of maps is an example of a category. Okay. It is an example of a category. And there are many other categories, which we'll study, for example, the category of vector spaces and linear maps between vector spaces. And that will have a composition as well. Uh, here is a, a morphism. You say uh, you use uh, arrows uh, to show the morphism. Morphism is a similar or just uh, it's is a map, a map or so set. Is a, uh, I'm confusing the morphism because I remember that you- okay. So I'm going to stop your question. So stop your question. So I, I got the question and uh, try to lower your volume because it's quite loud. Uh, okay. So um, what you remember from other classes and from your past is of no consequence to me. You have to leave that behind. You have to try to understand what I'm saying. Okay. What I introduced was first sets and maps of sets. This entire framework of sets and maps of sets is simply an example 
of a more general idea, which is the idea of a category. And the idea of a category doesn't have to be sets. It can be groups, it can be vector spaces, it can be manifolds, it can be all kinds of different objects can play the role that here in what we're talking about is played by sets. Okay, and there will be morphisms for us here, they're maps, but in the more complicated categories, they will have other names like homomorphisms of groups, linear maps of vector spaces, diffeomorphisms of manifolds, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, but it's a pattern. A category, the idea of a category is really a pattern that reoccurs many, many times in mathematics. Okay, let me leave it there and we're gonna take a 10 minute break and come back for part two. So, so we have the category of finite sets uh, in our hand and um, right, and, and when you have a category like that, um, uh, you can play certain games. You can you can in investigate the structure that's inherent in that in that category. So when you're so we're talking about finite sets, maps between finite sets, and we already um, we already kind of saw that uh, there's a great uh, variety of different types of maps uh, that you could you could have. You could have uh, something that looks more like an identity map, uh, and then you could have a, a, a kind of more complicated kind of map, which um, you know, which may leave out some possible values, and it may have some coincidences of values. Um, uh, and and so there's a question uh, right off the bat, which is there's a classification problem that immediately suggests itself, which is that. Uh, you would like to um, maybe classify the possibilities of what kind of maps can occur. Okay, and this is this is uh, again, it's an example of a pattern that repeats itself again and again in mathematics. That you introduce a certain playground, and then you look at the objects in the playground, and you try to classify them in some way. Right. So we would like to classify, or when I say classify, I just mean understand in some in some way that that is useful, right? And maybe completely describe, um, you know, what what is, a, you know, what is there a way of classifying finite sets? Is there a way of classifying maps between finite sets? So this is the, the this is the pattern. So having finite sets. Uh, we uh, may ask whether we can classify all finite sets and all maps between finite sets, okay? And it turns out that these types of classification or understanding problems, uh, they're really the foundational problems in all in all the subjects of mathematics. And uh, when we when we uh, convert from finite sets to uh, vector spaces, we're going to really uh, drill down on this classification problem for vector spaces. Uh, I just want to do it first for finite sets because it turns out that that when you do a classification in one category, okay, oftentimes that classification, like in this case for finite sets, it's going to uh, suggest and sometimes help to solve the classification problem in another category, like the category of vector spaces. Okay, so um, okay, so the first thing, the, the first thing that we want to uh, introduce is is some terminology, which describes different types of maps. So this is a, a description. Of, uh, of maps. So this is now, uh, so we're, we're, we're in part two now. Um, to, um,
classification of maps. Okay, so the most important uh, breakdown for types of maps, uh, there, there's three terms that are often used in all branches of mathematics. <clears throat> it's a, I'll just collect everything into one big definition. So a map, F from X to Y, is called injective when different inputs always result in different outputs. In other words, if x1 is not equal to x2, then f of x1 is not equal to f of x2. Okay, so in other words, uh, if I have a set mapping to another set, okay, this type of behavior is not allowed. Okay. You are not allowed to have two inputs which are smashed together into one output. So for example, here, this map here is not injective because you can see that one and three are both sent to the same output. One and three are different, but the outputs are the same. Okay, so this type of uh, collapse or redundancy or whatever you want to call it, that means that this map is not classified as being injective. Of course, this one is injective. This one doesn't have that collapse. So the identity maps are always injective. Another possibility, which is important and happens a lot, is called surjective. Let me just uh, let me just take this and make it a bit smaller. Okay, so surjective. Means that all possible Sorry, when all possible outputs in the codomain are achieved. Okay. In other words, for all points in the codomain, there exists. Sorry, let me write these clearly in case that there might be some people who are not familiar with this notation. This is a very typical notation and I'll, I'll spell it out in a moment. So for all points Y in the codomain, there, exist, there exists a point in the domain which is sent to it. Okay, so this means for all, and this means there exists. I know that many of you will have seen this, but some of you may not. It'll take a couple of weeks. It'll take a couple of weeks for us to all be on the same page in terms of language preparation, but um, it won't take long for you to uh, learn the lingo. Okay, so for all points in the codomain, we can hit that point, we can hit everything in the codomain um, by, uh, by choosing the appropriate point in the, uh, in the domain. So if we go back here, we see that 
that this map here, it fails to achieve the value one, and it also fails to achieve the value three. So this is definitely not surjective. Sir, uh, uh, well, I mean, Latin, or if you want uh, French, means on top of, right? So it covers it completely, right? So it's surjective. Ject in, in Latin means you throw, right? So it's almost like uh, uh, surjective means that when you take the stuff in the domain and you throw it onto the codomain, you cover it. That's what surjective means. So ject is throw and sur is kind of cover. So you cover everything by throwing the domain onto the codomain. Okay. Injective is more like, uh, you know, it's more like uh, when you inject someone with, I don't know, some kind of vaccine or something, then the liquid in the in the syringe, you know, goes into their blood, and it doesn't get disappeared. It, it's just, it's just, uh, it means that your mass will increase, you know. So nothing is getting collapsed. It's it's just adding to what's what's already in you. Anyway, sorry for the. Uh, so. Uh, Right, so uh, you could you could think of it this way that you have some whatever the domain is, it doesn't really matter. But if a map is surjective, that means that every point is going to be hit. Right, every point is going to be hit, maybe twice, maybe three times, maybe multiple times, but every single point has to be has to be hit. Sorry, that's too messy to, hopefully that makes sense. Now, uh, sometimes, and this is the nicest case, th these are the, the, most, um, the most beautiful kinds of maps in a way, or in some, kind, some way the, the simplest, is when, uh, is when both properties hold at the same time. And that's when it's called bijective. It's bijective when it's both. Both injective and surjective. Okay, and uh, okay, so ju just examples to keep in mind. This is injective. Oops. This is surjective. And then the interesting thing about bijections, and if you think about building a bijection, Think about what has to happen. So imagine that you're imagine that you're trying to form a bijection. Okay, so you need to send everything in the domain to something in the codomain. So this element of the domain has to be sent somewhere. So let's send it here. Okay, now what about the next one? The next one has to be sent somewhere, but it is not permitted to be sent to the same result because it, because if I want this thing to be bijective, that means that it has to be injective and this would not be allowed. Okay, so I'm not allowed to, to, to take the same value uh, more than once. So that means this has to be sent somewhere else. So I could pick any of the other possible uh, locations. So I'll send it there. This has to be sent somewhere, but I can't send it here. That's, per that's not permitted. And I can't send it there. That's not permitted. So I could send it here, let's say. And finally, this has to be sent somewhere, so I can just send it there. I, I'm not allowed to send it to the first three. I have to send it to somewhere else. Okay, so that guarantees that it's injective. Okay, but it's not surjective because there's some, some values here that are not taken on. There's, these are not achieved. So that means that it's impossible 
to make this into a bijection unless I modify the codomain and remove these points. So I just removed them. And now we are in a bijection situation. Okay. So we notice, notice that, that when you have a bijection, the, the two sides, the domain and the codomain, have the same size. They have the same cardinality. Okay. So bijections are um, the kind of pure, uh, nothing collapsed and nothing left out. Sometimes bijection, sometimes, uh, um, sometimes inject, injection. Um, yeah, let me just leave it at that. So these are the three main terms that are always used for the description of maps. Okay. Um, So any question about injective and surjective? I'm going to move on to discuss bijections uh, for the next little while. Nadim, please go ahead. Um, yes. Yeah, so my question was, um, since bijection is defined, right, that um, everything in the codomain is achieved, I was just wondering, why do we even consider points that aren't achieved to be part of the codomain if they're never going to be outputted anyways? Yeah, that's a very that's a good question. So again, Nadim is asking if you have a map which goes from uh, one set to another set, and if this map fails to achieve certain values, then why not just why not just remove those failed values and uh, and uh, consider the map uh, to be a surjective. Uh, Always, right? Any map could be converted into a surjective map by just removing all of the stuff that you don't hit. That's what you're asking, right? Yes. Well, uh, the uh, the the answer is very simple, right? Let's say that you uh, have you ever have you ever had one of those thermometers, the thermometer that that has liquid liquid in it. It could either be liquid alcohol or it could be liquid liquid um, mercury. Uh, yes. Right. So you're there looking at the thermometer, right? And the thermometer is giving you a uh, is giving you a map. It's mapping, uh, you know, uh, an a moment in time to a temperature, a value in the real line. At every moment in time, the thermometer, when you look at it, it provides you a number, right? And when it's warm, it goes up, and when it's cold, it goes down. And usually, if you're living in a, a, you know university accommodation, there's some kind of uh, restriction as to what that uh, what that value range is in your particular apartment, right? In my in my house, I can turn off the air conditioning, and I can live I can live at thirty at thirty five forty degrees Celsius, like I like I love it, like in in the heat, right? I can I can enjoy that in my house. And I can let the thermometer go up to a range that, that you don't have, right? So why don't you take out a hammer and smash all the regions of the thermometer, right, that are not achieved? Just smash them. They're not useful, right? I, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's the idea. The idea is that it's, it's important to consider, right, it's important to consider all the possible maps from one domain to one codomain because they usually come together as a whole. They usually come together and you don't want to view these maps as being extremely different from each other, so different that they have different codomain. Oftentimes you want, to, you, want, you, you want to graph your function, right? Like you want to say that, you see this function, it's useful to, to understand that this function is mapping from R to R and that it doesn't take on these values that you can you can go to the you know you can you can say that it doesn't take it doesn't take this this part of the codomain it doesn't take this uh, this value and we never we never actually delete uh, you know we never actually just look at the region of the codomain which is taken on and just remove the rest of it we don't do that we don't take this and just eliminate it from the picture right it's not that useful because there's other maps that you, you're going to need the full codomain and the full domain for. And you want to consider these maps and compare them, right? You want to compare y is equal to x with y is equal to x squared and y is equal to x quarter. 
you, you don't you don't want to consider all of these as being completely unrelated maps, right? With a different codomain. I'm just trying to give you the kind of the flavor of why it's so important to fix the domain and codomain uh, before you consider what the map's values are. You could think of the value of the map as being variable. Uh, okay, let me uh, let me stop the questions there and uh, go on. There's going to be an office hour, remember, so uh, so keep your questions for 20 minutes. Okay, so let's focus uh, focus on bijections for uh, for a minute. Bijections are um, very interesting. So uh, we're going to do an example, and we're going to study the uh, bijections. Let me use a. Uh, mm, Notation, I'll just use bij, bij from um, x to x. Uh, well, bijections, sorry, let me do a very simple example. So we're going to look at bijections um, from the set 1, 2, 3 to the set 1, 2, 3. So, uh, we're looking at bijections from a set to itself. Okay, and uh, let me um, draw a picture of such a bijection. Oops, sorry. Okay, so. What's the bijection? What's my? What's everyone's favorite bijection? Anyone? Identity map. The identity map. So we start with that. Where's the identity map? Okay, but there's many other there's many other maps. Oops. Okay, and let's take a look at these other maps. So, where else could one have been sent? Well, <clears throat> uh, let's just assume that one is still sent to one. Now, what about two? So if I send two to two, then three has to be sent to three because of bijectivity. So um, where else could I send two? I could send it to three. That's one possibility. And if I do that, then three has to be sent to two. So this is another bijection. I don't, I'm not going to give it a name right now, but uh, later we'll give it a name. So this is another bijection. <clears throat> and I've uh, already listed all the bijections in which one is sent to one. So we have, in order to write another bijection, we need to consider the possibility that one is sent somewhere else. So perhaps one is sent to two. If one is sent to two, then two has to be sent to either one or three, right? Just because of bijectivity. And so the first case is that two is sent to one and then three is, has to be sent to three. The other possibility when one is sent to two is that two is sent to three. And in that case, three has to be sent to one. So this would be, um, let me just organize them like this. So these are, th these, the first two are the ones where one is sent to one. The next two are the ones where one is sent to two. And then finally, we're going to need uh, some where one is sent to three. So if one is sent to three, then where will two be sent? It has to be one or two. That's the first possibility. And this is the second possibility. Okay, and uh, that means that we have written down all the bijections. So there are, so in other words, the cardinality of the set of bijections on the set one, two, three is six. There are exactly six bijections from 
one, two, three to itself. Now, there are more maps than just bijection. So the total number of maps is bigger than this, but the among those all those maps, there's a special class, a special set, set of maps, which are called the bijections, and those are listed right, right here. So this, if I put this into a big set, Now, this is a set. This is the set which I give this notation to, bij of one, two, three, of bijections. So, this is, so we've constructed a new set from an old set by considering the set of bijections from the set to itself. Maybe, maybe it, uh, maybe the, um, yeah, that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Now, there's a reason why I wanted to focus on bijections from, um, from a set to itself, okay? And th there's something very special that happens when the domain and the codomain of a map are the same. So here the domain and the codomain of all these maps, they're all the same, it's one, two, three, okay? And because the codomain of this map, because the codomains, the codomains and the domains are always the same, that means that any pair of these maps is composable. It's possible for me to compose this with this, this with this, and in both orders. You could do this one and then that one, or you could do this one and then that one. Okay, so the order of composition, they could be composed in, in either case. So the, the nice thing about maps from a set to itself is that any pair, any pair of maps, F, G in map, X, X, they don't even have to be bijections, but all maps from X to X can be composed. So for example, uh, you could try to, well, we already know how this composes with any of the other five because it's the identity. So it composes with this, let's say, to give this back again. So this composed with this. Let me, let me just give these names temporarily. So I'll call this uh, uh, F and G, say. So let's just do an example. So, Suppose that I take F and G, so let me just grab F and G. Okay, and suppose that I do, um, suppose, suppose I do F first, and then I compose with G. So I'll, I'm gonna use this graphical notation. I compose it with G. Okay, now here I'm kind of deliberately trying to confuse you because I'm saying, yeah, see, this is, this is quite confusing because the notation, the notation of a map composed another map. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I think this is too much confusion. I, let me not do it this way. So th this is the definition of F and G. Let's say if I want to compute F composed G. Okay, if I want to compute F compose G, I need to first apply F. And then apply G. Okay, and then I can, I can simplify the result by just following the lines. One is sent to two. Two is sent to three, and three is sent to one.
Okay, so that's what I got. Now, if you look over here, you'll see that the result is, is a bijection, of course. Well, actually, I, you should, you, you can check that the composition of any two bijections is a bijection, but let's just take a look. What, you know, how do I know that it is? Well, it's because it's on the list, actually. This thing is right over here, right? So if I, if I give this one a name temporarily, let's say uh, H, we see that this is equal to H. So we see that, um, that G composed F is H. Okay, and you can continue this uh, for any pair here. So I could take, for example, um, this and compose it with this. I'll just continue. Let's call this one I and J. So for example, if I do I compose J, this means do J first and then I. So uh, just, to simp just to make it the calculation faster, let me just draw the domain and codomain, right? And then you don't have to draw everything. You could just check where one is sent. So one by J is sent to three, and then I sends three to two. So that means that one is sent to two. Where does two get sent? J sends two to two, and I sends two to one, so it goes to one. And then three gets sent, it must be sent to three. So we see that I composed with J is also on the list, and it's G. Okay, so what are we finding? So we're, we're finding that, um, that we have a, an interesting feature that any two of these six objects, see six things, these six maps, okay, any two of them can be, uh, can be combined together and what the result will be one of these six things. Okay, so the idea is that um, the composition So this means that the bijections, you can check this, but the bijections from one, two, three to itself is closed under composition. This means that if we compose any two bijections, we get a bijection, okay? So that's when they say closed, it, what it means is that it does not escape to uh, and become another kind of map. Um, it means that uh, the um, we don't get a more general map in the maps from one, two, three to one, two, three. Oops, sorry. Okay, there are many other maps in the maps from one, two, three to itself. Besides these ones, these six are only, they're only the nicest, most beautiful maps. And the point is that uh, that you could think of it as you could think of it like this, that, that there's a, a set of all maps from X to X. And then inside there, there's a subset. We're gonna talk about subsets uh, shortly, which are the bijections from X to X, okay? And this, uh, this, uh, these maps have a composition operation. So if you take any two of these maps, then we can compose I'm not trying to freak you out or anything, but I'm just trying to give you kind of a picture of what's happening. This is supposed to be a picture of taking two maps from X to X and combining them together by composition. That's why I put the little composition symbol in 
the vertex there, okay? And then it will produce an output. Like for example, we just composed, um, what was the example that we just did? Uh, I composed J is G. So this is I, J, and G, okay? So we have a composition operation for maps. But the cool thing is that if these maps happen to be in the bijections, right, and if we apply this operation to, to them, we get something that's also inside the bijections. Oops, sorry. Okay, now that's that's an interesting feature of these bijections. So, uh, what what are we what are we obtaining here? This means that this gives a, a, us an example of what's called a binary operation. On the set. of bijections a binary operation this is something that takes two inputs and has one output so a bi binary operation always looks like this if two inputs and one output That's what a binary operation is. So, uh, so the so what you need is F and G. And the bijections. gives rise to F circle G in the bijections. Okay, this is the result of the binary operation. And um, notice also that the bijections on, uh, from a set to itself has a distinguished element the identity map. So the identity map is always in here somewhere. Um, I'll draw it. It's very distinguished, so I'll color it in purple. The identity map on X is one of the bijections from X to X. Okay, so uh, that's number one. I'll, I'll just use uh, X for this. So we have, uh, that's the first piece of information. So we get a binary operation, which I just denoted by little circle. That's the composition. It also has a distinguished element, the identity element. And I shouldn't use this bold arrow. That's usually for implication. So I'm just stating two, three facts about bijections. And the third uh, really interesting thing is that every bijection has what is called an inverse, an inverse so what 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 is this? So let's go back to the list of bijections. so, so an inverse, it, uh, it's kind of interesting that it even makes sense to talk about inversion in this case. But an inverse is basically uh, like uh, flipping the, the direction of the map around, okay? Now, 
that's something that you have to be very careful with because if you take a general map and you try to reverse it, that's going to fail to be a map, right? Especially if it's not surjective or, it, or injective, right? If, it's, if you had a map like this, okay, if you look at this map, there's no way for me to flip this diagram around and think of this as a map. The reason is that if I flip it around, I don't know if I can actually flip it around. Let's see. Why does it not let me? I can make it larger. Well, anyway, uh, if you tried to flip it around, you would get this. Okay, and then you see the problem, which is that this thing in the domain is not being sent anywhere. Okay, and therefore this is not a map. Not a map. Okay, so you have to be very careful. And for example, if you were to, if you were to uh, reverse this one, then what would you get? You would, you would get something truly bizarre. Okay, you can reverse the picture, but the picture doesn't really have a meaning anymore. This is definitely not a map because it doesn't even tell you where this element is sent. It's unspecified. So this diagram, it's a diagram, it's a nice picture and everything, but it's not a map. It's not a diagram of a map. Okay. So you have to be careful when you're, when you're uh, dealing with this concept of map. Um, so when you reverse a map, you don't get a map in general. And, and so, what we say is that most maps do not have inverses. But every one of these bijections definitely has an inverse. So if we look at these, we're almost out of time, but this is okay. So this is a good uh, point to, uh, to stop on. So for example, this one, right? If I wanted the inverse of this, what would it be? Well, I need, if, if I were to flip this around, I would just get another picture that looks exactly like this. So the, the correct thing is that F is its own inverse. Uh, on the other hand, if I look at, and G is also its own inverse, and the identity is also its own inverse, okay? And this one is also its own inverse. But the cool thing is that this is not its own inverse. Because if I flip it over, I'm gonna get this one. So the inverse of H is I, and the inverse of i is h, okay? So now we're starting to see certain algebraic properties showing up. Every bijection has an inverse, okay? And uh, we're gonna talk more about inverses on, on Thursday, but uh, for now, let me just leave it unspecified what, it, what an inverse is, okay? And, and this means that that we have the you know the the result is that the set bijections of x is not just a set it is a set of course but it has more structure than just a set so it is equipped with a binary operation which takes F and G, an ordered pair of bijections and sends it to F circle G. Uh, so it has a binary operation, a distinguished identity element, X, and uh, 
exists and, and it has inverses for all elements. And such that the operation is associative. This is the definition of a group. The set of bijections equipped with this binary operation, as well as the identity is an example of a group. A group is exactly something of this type. It's a set with a binary operation and a distinguished identity and the existence of inverses for all elements such that this operation is associative. Okay, so this is just the first step. On Thursday, we're gonna elaborate more on this, but what I've just explained is um, the first upgrade of the notion of a finite set. The upgrade is that the set is equipped with extra operations which satisfy extra conditions. So it has structure, the structure being the binary operation to distinguish identity in the inverse map. And that structure satisfies conditions, namely associativity. And anytime you have something like that, we call it a group. Those are the axioms for groups. And the most, um, and this, this group is just called the bijections of, uh, of a finite set. So we're gonna study that in more, uh, in more detail later. Okay, let's leave it there. Um, See you on Thursday.